Okay, so welcome again, everybody, uh, to this, our last media research group um, of the year. Um, very delighted uh, to have a special guest with us today, um, Dr. Kieran Foster. Uh, Kieran is an associate lecturer at De Montfort University and Nottingham Trent University. Um, he's written extensively on the topic of unmade films, which is what he's talking to us um, about today. Uh, he's the co-editor of Bloomsbury's Shadow Cinema, the historical and uh, the historical and production context of unmade films. Um, I should have practiced that one. Uh, and he's currently writing his monograph based on his PhD thesis called Hammer Goes to Hell, the Unmade Films of the House of Horror for Edinburgh University Press. Um, and Kieran was also the producer of Vampirella, a live script reading in 2019. Um, so uh, Kieran's talk today is um, supported actually by um, the British Association Film Television Screen Studies uh, New Connections scheme. So we're, we're really lucky um, that, that they supported that and by Edinburgh University Press as well. So um, thanks to them. I'm not sure if anybody's here from BAFs or, or EUP. Um, and Kieran's talk today is called Shadow Cinema, Unmade Films and the Archive. And I'm going to hand over to Kieran. Okay, thanks, Laura. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I hope you're all good. Uh, I'm going to load up my slides. I'll make a start. Okay. So hopefully you can all see those um, and hear me as well. Yeah. Okay. I'm officially all muted. Fantastic. Yeah. Fine. Thank you. <laughs> um, so yeah, this uh, talk today. Um, is going to be kind of, hopefully just to have um, three kind of mini sections to it. Uh, I'm going to try and map my own approach to unmade films in relation to existing work uh, and provide a few case studies uh, of an unmade film uh, or two unmade projects uh, and examine how reconstructions and adaptations of unmade projects can complicate and add to the, the debates and discussions uh, about unmade films generally. Uh, okay, so not to um, rerun over the introduction, uh, but my name uh, is Kieran and I worked in a Hammer script archive while I was doing my PhD um, from 2015 to 2019. Um, the Hammer script archive was delivered to De Montfort University in 2012 um, and has and is essentially uh, a very large cupboard, but it has lots of scripts and posters in there and correspondence and things like that. Uh, I began the project in October 2015, and there was a second delivery of Hammer Archive materials in April uh, 2016, um, which reshaped the project slightly, and some of those materials I'll be discussing today as well. Um, so first of all, uh, I thought I'd just give a bit of background to how my research ca came about and some of the um, kind of key texts that helped move the um, project on towards unmade films as well. So my interest in Hammer came uh, from my MA project, uh, which, as most studies of Hammer uh, films did, um, ignored unmade films entirely uh, and basically more, focused more on the aesthetics and narratives of the movies. Uh, however, uh, during that time, um, it did obviously mean I was kind of getting immersed in Hammer and Hammer films more generally. Uh, and there was two texts that uh, were really, really useful uh, for, uh, for the eventual study that happened in 2015. Um, the first one I came across uh, was by uh, Peter Hutchins, uh, and it was a chapter in the edited collection Sights and Scene that was uh, produced by Dan North in 2008. Um, the, uh, Peter's text was uh, really useful for me because it was one of the first texts I'd come across that utilised an unmade hammer project to make their central point. In that case, it was specifically about night creatures which was a, a self-adaptation of Iron Legend uh, by Richard Matheson from 1958. Um, Peter's work basically looked at, as a kind of comparative analysis between the night creatures and other works uh, based on Iron Legend. So I came across that during the MA and it was super useful and kind of informative and enlightening in terms of how one made films could be utilized uh, in that kind of specific context. And the second one I was looking at was when I was kind of trawling through some uh, magazines, fan magazines on Hammer. And there was one called The House of Hammer. And I was looking through them to help the MA thesis, obviously try and find useful tidbits. Uh, but the key thing I found was uh, an interview that was conducted by Des Skin and John Brosnan. 
And the interview was a second part interview from 1978 with Michael Carreras, who was the head of the uh, Hammer films at the time. And what was really fascinating about this interview was that he was talking about Hammer's future projects. Now, Hammer Films closed in 1979. Um, there wasn't to be any future projects, but it was really interesting to see this conversation happening about these projects at the time that they were being kind of put into production. So it, they weren't artifacts that had long since been kind of cancelled, delayed or, or shelved. Uh, they were active productions at the time this interview was taking place. And it was something really kind of um, clear about the creative and economic labor that was going into the, these films and, and the amount of resources it was taking Hammer. Uh, and, and those kind of really, really got this idea of the unmade films into my head. Uh, around this time as well, I, I visited the Hammer Script Archive for the first time while I was doing my MA. Um, I used my um, super research skills to Google Hammer Archive and found out that there was one in Leicester uh, at DMU and I emailed uh, Kathy, the Cinema and Television History Institute there, and they uh, allowed me to come up for the day. Um, at, that, at this point, I, I honestly, barely any of the stuff I, I looked at in the archive ended up in the thesis. I kind of got carried away and was just looking at projects that sounded cool. Uh, but it, it obviously the serendipity of that visit cannot really be um, overstated in relation to the study itself. That's where I met a lot of the people uh, at DMU who, I would, who would help me with the project. Uh, it's where I became aware of how much unmade material was in the archive. And this was when I was made aware of the M4 City um, funding opportunities um, available through the AHRC, um, which I, was, I eventually ended up on. Uh, so that visit was obviously extremely crucial and also, of course, completely random. And that's why I really like this quote here from uh, Velez Cerner, um, which is, pops up very early on in, in the actual PhD thesis as well. Uh, it says it is easy to underestimate the degree to which simple availability and access can determine entire research paths. I was extremely fortunate uh, to have the access that I did. And obviously the availability of the archive, like all archives, only existed because very skilled uh, and, and talented people had curated and kept this material safe um, over the years for, for me to then have a look at. Um, so uh, I was very fortunate in how that kind of ended up working out. All right. Uh, and yeah, just to just to kind of re uh, to emphasize some of the kind of numbers in the Hammer Script Archive, um, there, it holds files, literal kind of just paper files, on exactly a hundred unmade television and film projects at the moment, uh, with about one hundred and eighty-five separate pieces of kind of ephemera di directly relating to unmade films. Um, things like screenplays, treatments, financial documentation, extensive correspondence. Uh, posters, although they are, I think, all for produced movies, production stills and press books as well. And that's what's in the kind of the, the script archive. You know, sadly, there's no kind of Christopher Lee's cape or, or you know, Frankenstein uh, costumes. It is just, uh, just paper. OK, so unmade films generally. What I wanted to do here is basically just signpost unmade films as a wider branch of study before I go into my Hammer case study, uh, because um, I've been I've been obviously studying on made films for oh yes shoot nearly six years and the the amount the wealth of material that was there um, is really impressive and even though a lot of it as I'll get into is often a chapter here a journal article here kind of disparate pieces there is some really excellent work on made films that um, allowed me to form kind of a theoretical approach to the production study as I went forward so uh, and the advantage of doing this talk in my own office, I guess, would be that there's a kind of uh, props is the, is the advantage. Um, really interesting kind of popular books, not academic works on unmade films were kind of my first way into it, uh, pre-project. So David Hughes' uh, Tales, uh, The Greatest Sci-Fi Movies Never Made was a big one. Uh, Tales from Development Hell as well is the kind of the, the book after that, which kind of broadens it. Uh, and then there's books like The Greatest Movies You'll Never See, uh, which has, which is also kind of impressive because it also features kind of fan-made posters for them as well. Um, so very much these, these books are, are, are interesting and have lots of great primary research and information within them, uh, but they are often, obviously uh, they're, not, they're not academic uh, in terms of like trying to kind of create a theoretical framework. 
uh, but they're also quite often kind of author based. So you can just have to have a look at this greatest movie you'll ever see uh, to see, you know, your Hitchcocks, your Wells and your Kubricks on there. Um, often kind of presenting a, a approach of this unmade project is interesting and notable because of the person who was going to make it as opposed to the project itself, which again is, you know, is, a, is an approach to unmade films. It's completely valid examining a director's work through those kind of projects. Um, but it does often seem to be the, the same directors um, get the nod time and time again. Uh, Kubrick is obviously uh, himself has had an inordinate an amount of uh, work dedicated to him on his uh, produced films, but also unproduced films. Um, the best example uh, being Alison's Castle's uh, incredible and, and huge volume on Napoleon um, that was a really, really kind of, well, incredibly detailed uh, piece of, of work, but also just extremely useful. Uh, to me to be able to see the uh, kind of extent and, and breadth of unmade uh, film studies can do. Uh, away from this kind of focus on directors, uh, another kind of really huge text on unmade films, um, for me anyway, uh, it's, it was probably, I would probably say the most important one would be Simone Murray's article, uh, Phantom Adaptations, Eucalyptus, The Adaptation Industry, and The Film That Never Was. Um, Essentially, this is a really interesting look at how it can be used within adaptation studies, uh, unmade films, that is. Um, Murray says, quote, uh, that this, the work is an attempt, the examination, rather, of an unmade film is an attempt to frustrate adaptation studies, habitual recourse to comparative textual analysis and force the discipline to engage with potential alternate methodologies for understanding how adaptation functions, end quote. Um, so yeah, Murray calls this a, a phantom adaptation uh, and her, her work is basically looking at the industrial modes of production on this unmade project, kind of making the argument that if there is no text at the end, then you can't do that comparative analysis that, that she, can't, she says is kind of over, overdone. So what, what um, Murray is doing there is utilising an unmade text to kind of rethink, force a rethink of methodological approaches to adaptation studies in this case, uh, but also that can be applied to, as we'll go on to later, like fandom studies, um, kind of media studies, film studies as well. Um, so this article, uh, the uh, Phantom Adaptation article by Simone Murray, um, is extremely kind of effective way at looking at how the gaps and absences in established scholarship can be kind of probed and looked into. Uh, and there's other articles that um, look into this as well. Shelley Cobb has a fantastic 2014 blog post called, got all my names written down, um, Women Directors and Lost Projects, Writing the Histories of Women's Unmade Films. And it's a fantastic example of how kind of gaps in the history of women, women filmmakers, which are, are, can often be a lot larger than men, um, can be filled in by looking at their unmade projects. So it's not that uh, a woman filmmaker makes a makes a movie and then disappear doesn't you know disappears for eight years and then comes back and makes another film. There is this usually these kind of long gaps in which they are trying to get other projects off the ground. Um, and Cobb in this uh, really excellent blog post kind of sounds out how looking at these unmade projects can kind of create a more detailed, uh, precise um, film history uh, of women filmmakers. Um, and finally, in terms of just using unmade films um, within research, uh, recently Hannah Hamad uh, did an excellent chapter in the edit collection Shadow Cinema um, that myself, James Fennick, and uh, Dr. David Elridge did, um, came out last year. Uh, and that chapter is on how an unmade film, of the, uh, which was about going, to, going to be about the Yorkshire Ripper, was eventually um, cancelled because of the outcry at the time. They were trying to make the film even before he had been caught. Um, and the, obviously the outcry and the, and the backlash it got, got that film uh, cancelled. And Hamad is doing a really um, brilliant kind of examination of, of the Ripper in relation to kind of media at the moment. And that unmade film just plays a small part in that project, just adds a little extra context. So it is not the main centerpiece of the study, but it helps kind of add deep and further contextualization to it. So these examples uh, hopefully uh, show that not only are made films kind of malleable in terms of how they can be used as a resource, um, but they can also be used within or to kind of counteract various methodologies as well. 
um, and they've also been utilized effectively for quite a long time um, in kind of various forms. So yeah, the PhD, uh, as I say, was funded by the AHRC and focused specifically on Hammers Unmade Films and the Hammer Script Archive. Uh, however, it also utilized documentation held at the BFI Archive, uh, National Archives, as well as the Warner Brother Archive and the Margaret Herrick Library in the US, uh, and was also hugely helped uh, by interviews and assistance uh, from Hammer historians, people like Marcus Hearn, who writes extensively at Hammer, uh, and Dennis Meikle as well, who's, who's, who's literally written the book on it as well. And uh, me being able to interview these people helped address a lot of gaps uh, in the methodology, which, um, yeah, I'll, I'll no doubt get into. So what I would like to do is present a couple of kind of small case studies. Uh, instead of me kind of describing the project in, in broad strokes, we just go, we'll look into a few films um, and hopefully you'll be able to see how well-made films are, are kind of useful and helpful in that respect. So, as I say, this was a, my, my work was a production study of Hammer films, which is in no way um, unique kind of thing. The uniqueness of the project was the unmade films being foregrounded as the, um, as the kind of tools to do this analysis. So Hammer Films is a, a British production company. Um, in 1957, they produced uh, The Curse of Frankenstein, which um, was the kind of first British color gothic horror film. That film was extremely successful, both uh, nationally and internationally, and led to Hammer producing a, a, a string of um, kind of gothic horror films, including uh, Christopher Lee in, in Dracula uh, and The Mummy. Uh, and these films and the success of these films allowed Hammer in the 1960s to kind of spin off and do lots of different things. So they had kind of these black and white uh, crime dramas. They had big prehistoric, almost block, you know, proto blockbusters in things like One Million BC, as well as these gothic horror films. They had a very successful sixties, not just because of that horror formula, but also because of um, the fact that they could use that to build on other genres as well. By the nineteen seventies, however, uh, they were struggling, um, mainly due to the, the kind of wholesale withdrawal of American finance. Um, America, uh, Hammer had become extremely reliant on American finance throughout the 60s. Um, basically, they'd turn up, Tom Chantrell would do a cool poster, they would go into an American studio and say, this will be the next film, here's the poster. Um, they would say, yeah, and they would make that movie. And once that funding started to disappear, that's extraordinarily reductive, by the way, don't worry. <laughs> there will be slightly better um, research later on. Uh, but that kind of played in um, to Hammer's financial strategy basically was wholly reliant on um, American finance. So when America pulled out of the British film industry in the 70s, Hammer were left um, short and they were heavily relying on British comedy spin-offs and sequels um, to pre-existing -pre series as well. And as Marcus Hearn notes, this lack of finance or Hammer's usually super successful ratio of produced to unproduced films suddenly um, invert. So what's interesting as well here is the Knights Hammer are extremely prolific as a studio in terms of the films that they produce in the 60s. By the 1970s, this changes quite dramatically. Uh, between 1975 and 1979, they only make two movies um, before their closure in April 1979. That period, though, is extremely kind of, uh, it's an extremely creative period for the company. And while they're not producing anything and closing, it led to quite a lot of kind of um, examinations of Hammer, maybe leaning a bit towards that, oh yeah, they, their product became stagnant, so they uh, went out of business. I think what looking at their unmade films will hopefully show is that it wasn't a lack of innovation that kind of killed the company. Um, it was really, um, arguably the other way around, too much ambition and, and focusing maybe on, on, on projects that shouldn't have been a priority for a company of that size at the time. So Dracula um, was ha one of Hammer's biggest franchises in 1958. Uh, the first one comes out, uh, but there is numerous sequels um, throughout the 1960s. Um, Christopher Lee is in most of them, uh, bar two. Uh, he's not in The Legend of the Seven Golden Vampires, the uh, first Kung Fu horror spectacular, exclamation point. Uh, but he is in um, Dracula AD 1972. Now by the 70s, the, even the Dracula formula had grown a little tired and American studios were pretty much only interested in Dracula movies from Hammer. Uh, but even then it was kind of getting a bit 
tenuous and difficult for the company to to get that funding they pivoted towards modern day Drac uh, a modern day dracula which is what you can see there dracula ad 1972 because um there had been proven successes in that genre um blackula had come out the year before uh, which was a contemporary uh, vampire film in los angeles and then you had count yorga vampire as well which was also set in la so this was a, an attempt to jump onto that kind of very small but successful cycle of um, modern vampire movies or ancient vampire in modern times uh, and they produced a sequel of it as well uh, satanic rites of dracula which came out in 74 um 73 sorry the legend of the seven golden vampires uh, christopher lee did not return for it it's the final installment in um the dracula franchise and it is important uh, to this study You'll, for num numerous reasons that we'll see uh, but basically the thing to remember for this one is they had a co-production deal with Shaw Brothers, who were famous uh, in Hong Kong for their Kung, uh, Kung Fu films. Um, both studios kind of at a low point at this, at this stage uh, teamed together what they hoped would be a kind of a successful mash of Kung Fu film and horror movie. Uh, it starred Peter Cushing as Van Helsing again, but as I say, Christopher Lee did not turn up to play Dracula. That honor went to John Forbes Robertson in pretty much panto makeup. Uh, but those two films are, are important because it shows that Hammer are really trying to think outside the box in, in Dracula. This is no longer a franchise that has that kind of pan-European, but never really expressed where it is directly setting with him preying on a numerous people in the small village. They're trying to think outside the box with the typical Dracula formula. Which leads us to Dracula in India. Um, and I put here one place, two projects. So there is two well-known, I say well-known, um, not, not famously well-known, but certainly in some hammer circles, well-known uh, kind of Dracula and India projects. However, it wasn't known that they were two separate projects really um, for a while. So there is a Dracula in India story called The Unquenchable First of Dracula, um, which sees Dracula travel to India uh, after being run out of Transylvania for being an all-round uh, bad bloke uh, and basically setting up shop in India and running this kind of what's called um, kind of a blood cult. However, uh, as you can see from these uh, notes, they, there seems to be a title change halfway through. So we have the unquenchable first of Dracula is the Dracula in India unmade story everyone kind of is aware of. And then there's these notes that, um, for example, say, Hind's story was overhauled and various drafts of what became Carly, Devil Bride of Dracula were written. Don Houghton revised Hind's script, submitted a 19-page treatment under the striking new title, Carly, Devil Bride of Dracula. And then another quote here, after the moderate success of Seven Golden Vampires, Tony Hind's script was later dusted, uh, dusted off, retitled as Carly, Devil Bride of Dracula, and handed over to the resourceful Chris Rooking. So what is kind of important to note here is that the Hammer script archive clearly shows that Kali, Devil Bride of Dracula, is a completely different Dracula in India project than Unquenchable First of Dracula. So there was this kind of assumption that because it's pretty niche as a concept, Dracula in India, that that was just an alternate title. But it's quite clear from the archive that these are two separate projects that have two very distinct um, production processes, which I'll break down in a moment. So we have Unquenchable First of Dracula and Kali Devil Bride of Dracula, which are two distinct Dracula Goes to India projects. Okay. So Unquenchable First of Dracula originally starts <laughs> with a different title, Dracula High Priest of Vampires in 1970. This is going to be the first in a series of uh, old white men staring longingly into the distance, by the way, so do keep track of those. Um, Tony Hines, uh, who is pictured here, had been one of the biggest creative forces in Hammer until his resignation in May 1970. Um, however, in September that year, Hines, effectively as a freelance writer for Hammer, turns in Dracula, High Priest of Vampires, um, the Dracula Goes to India project. Hines had served in India during World War II, um, and had a, a love of the place and had written up uh, previous Dracula movies as well. It's delivered to Warner Brothers president Norman Katz that same month. 
uh, but the project is ultimately declined for being too expensive and Warner's goes with the contemporary set Dracula, 19, uh, Dracula AD 1972 instead. So at this point, it's basically, do we go for Dracula in India or Dracula AD 1972? And they choose to go with the contemporary um, Dracula, probably, as I say, because they've been proven success in that contemporary uh, vampire field. So the script uh, itself, High Priest of Vampires, is held in the Hammer Script archive, at least one draft of it. Uh, and it features the protagonist, who's called Penny, uh, traveling to India to find her missing sister, who is ultimately discovered to have been taken by Dracula. Uh, as I say, he's been driven out of Transylvania and moved to India at this point. Uh, and when Penny finds out her sister was taken by Dracula, she finds herself in the middle of a feud between Dracula and the Rani, who is the high priest of her own cult, the Temple of Blood. Uh, and the script ends on what war would have been for Hammer in particular, who very much liked their good conquered evil narrative. On a pretty shocking note, uh, Dracula kills, um, well, Dracula has turned Penny into a vampire. So even though you do, Dracula gets a very dramatic death sequence as usual, it actually ends with Penny killing the love interest, the male love interest, um, at the end as a vampire. So it has some really interesting stuff in it, this script. Which brings us to Carly. Devil Bride of Dracula, which was a poster made by Tom Chantrell. Um, in fact, both were as well. So what happens here effectively is, as I say, that project gets um, quashed because they want to do the contemporary Draculas instead. Those two contemporary Dracula films come out. And then we have Legend of the Seven Golden Vampires, um, the Kung Fu horror one that comes out in 74. This is actually uh, enough of a success for Warner Brothers in 1974, for them to want to do another globe-trotting Dracula picture. That's my own words. That wasn't an attempt at a new genre. So they want another Dracula in um, picture. And due to a, a strange government, well, not necessarily strange, but certainly an interesting government rule, um, Warner Brothers' profits in India, so any profits they made off their films in India at the time, could only be spent in India. Uh, so they asked Hammer to devise an Indian Dracula picture, so a Dracula in India and Dracula in India picture. Hammer originally, and we've got kind of correspondence on this, go back to them saying, oh, great, we did this, remember? In 1970, Tony Hines, High Priest of Vampires, why don't we just do this? And they said, no, it's still too expensive. So even though they have exactly what they're looking for, they, they basically are forced by Warners to think of a cheaper, um, different Dracula in India project. Um, more complex in its financial necess uh, necessities, due to the rupees being held by the Indian government, Warner also needed them to approve the project. So just to add another kind of fly in the ointment, basically, if Hammer were going to get this film made in, with Warner's approval, Warner would have to get the sign off of the script by the Indian government, or certainly representatives of the government. So this is, as I say, a distinct project. It's set specifically in 1856, um, which is quite rare. Usually these films are set in the 19th century, but a to have a specific date is uh, pretty rare on these. Uh, it's months before the Indian Rebellion, um, which saw um, some Sepoy soldiers kind of rise up um, as, as, a, as in a rebellion as a protest against a kind of um, British colonialists. Uh, and it kind of, there was a lot of, um, a lot of bloodshed and it was quite a uh, kind of grim part of, of that history, colonial history. So it was a real life kind of event that had happened and this film is set just before then. It focuses on the impending wedding of two um, demonic entities to quote the treatment, uh, Dracula and the Hindu goddess Kali. If you look on the right there, uh, that's the actual screenshot of the um, a scan of the, the, the treatment that's held in the archive. So Dracula only appears twice in this script, uh, once whilst traveling and then again for the finale. And it has similarities in this respect to Legend of the Seven Golden Vampires, where you actually only see Dracula as Dracula at the beginning and the end. Um, so basically, you, it sounds like they were not going to get Christopher Lee for this one because he's a, the, the guy playing Dracula only pops up twice. I don't think you, Christopher Lee would get out of bed for um, a couple of scenes like that. So Dracula is off screen. Kali is obviously the plot device is um, to kind of, um, Kali to kind of come to life. So the role of the antagonist is given to the evil high priest, um, Shinwa Khan, who is kind of trying to create this, this, um, this kind of meeting of these two de demons. Um, 
And Van Helsing's dad is the protagonist. So again, they were looking at Peter Cushing for this. So very different to the High Priest of Dracula one, even though it is uh, another, as I say, Dracula in India story. So uh, bearing all this in mind, the fact that they had a very difficult um, situation where Warner Brothers were only making this movie because they had to spend money in India, but the movie had to be approved by the Indian government. Don Horton had written this script and he had written this script for Legend of Seven Golden Vampires too. And Horton does a really interesting thing here where the high priest Shinwa Khan is actually revealed at the end that the actual Hindu goddess Kali um, is, is not actually part of this story. It's, it's a hoax. It is an actually a different evil entity. Um, so it's kind of built up that it's going to be the Hindu goddess Kali. And then this kind of, it turns out that the uh, Shinwa Khan has lied to Dracula and it's this other demon and uh, demonic entity. And an actual statue of Kali is what kills Dracula and Shinwa Khan. It falls from the temple and kills them both as if Kali uh, herself has kind of wrought justice against them. And this was Don Horton's very clever way, as you'll see, of trying to circumvent any criticisms. But Michael Carreras, who was the head of Hammer, he is our um, top, the top guy there on the picture. He's the head of Hammer at this time. We have a bit of correspondence from him to Don Horton. And he's giving notes on the script. And he says, uh, on her travels, I suggest Kylie, a sort of motivated mummy, has young village lads brought to her for sex with six hands, wow, and then she emasculates them, a nice contrast to what Dracula is up to. So he completely seems to miss the sensitivity that Don Houghton is at least trying to get across and suggests that basically Kali is brought in as a, um, as a, as a mummy figure, as an, as an evil figure. Don Houghton uh, responds to this. He says, uh, quote, the Indians, and I believe audiences generally, uh, will tolerate and accept some monster and grim figment of our imagination posing as Kali and even defiling her religious aura. But the person or creature must be a fake. You will note that in my storyline, it is Kali manifested by her statue, which destroys Shinwa Khan and Dracula. It is her retribution for the blasphemy that's been perpetrated in her name. The Indians will appreciate this. Um, oh, will applaud this. Sorry, I can't see. <laughs> my Zoom uh, screen is uh, in the way, which I can quite clearly move. Um, we'll applaud this and all, all other audiences will understand it. If I may make a ludicrous parallel, it would be totally wrong dramatically, logically, and to the very many people, unpleasantly blasphemous for us to visibly reincarnate, say, the Virgin Mary in fiction and then linking her with Dracula. So what we have here and what the archive shows us is tensions between the screenwriter who to say he you know he, he works at hammer he's a script editor at hammer but it's he's actually having to push back against a managing director of hammer who doesn't see the issue in the kind of grim motivated mummy thing that he's suggesting and what is kind of very clear is that these tensions and, and again can only kind of go into this one piece of correspondence but this conversation kind of is ongoing and what happens is an extraordinarily time sensitive issue as we'll get to um, is completely delayed. And we end, and that's basically how this project ends up not getting made. Uh, so as you can see in the bottom left here, another piece of correspondence from Michael Carreras, the managing director, to the screenwriter, Don Horton. He says, Warners have indicated to me that we should develop this project into screenplay form as quickly as possible. Uh, and he said, PS, speed is of the essence. Now, Don Horton has said in an interview, he said that Warner had an enormous amount of blocked rupees in India and wanted to use them to make a film. Suddenly, while we're in pre-production, the Indian government changed its monetary policy and gave Warner Brothers all their blocked rupees. Consequently, they didn't want to make a picture in India anymore. So this tension between screenwriter and managing director and the production context, which they were having to work, they're having to work in because of a consequence of that American funding completely being withdrawn, this kind of... Um, conditional funding is completely pulled away from them because India goes, in fact, no, you can just have the rupees that you've made and you can spend them anywhere. And that allows Warner Brothers to just get that money and go, okay, so we don't need to make a film in India necessarily, therefore we won't. 
and that is the end of the uh, the, the uh, Carly project. However, again, this is a really useful project in being able to examine this development of um, Dracula as a character, because if we just focus on Hammer's produced Dracula movies, this, the story, the development, and the economic and creative labor of, of this character for the company ends with Legend of the Seven Golden Vampires. And what we act, what's actually very clear is there is an active effort even after that to try and keep this character profitable and, and a part of this long running um, series. So how am I doing for time? Okay, yeah, we're good. Goodish. I might have to go quickly. Okay. So I just wanted to talk about another project um, called Nessie. In 1976 and 1978, this one was developed. Now, what is interesting about this project and, and why I, I, I have, it's kind of a key focus of the thesis and it's a project that I've, I've spent a lot of work on, is that again, going back to that idea of availability and access in the archives, um, we have a, an extensive folder uh, or of correspondence of financial documentation um, that kind of on Nessie, we have scripts, we have correspondence, we have kind of monetary details. We can get a really good picture of Nessie. There's not too many large gaps, although there is some. Uh, so we, Nessie, actually, we have quite a good picture of its development uh, and kind of what went wrong and, uh, and, and, and how it kind of developed. So the kind of context of Nessie, uh, here's an advert that popped up in Variety uh, during the Cannes Film Festival uh, on the right there. So the first sign of the project pops up in January 1976 in the archive. Uh, it's got Clark Reynolds and Chris Wickham working on a script in-house for Hammer. And at the time, it seems to be a kind of a creature feature. Hammer have had this kind of experience before. They did, uh, like I said, 1 million BC and um, kind of quite a few prehistoric films as well. By 1976, however, the project has become extremely complex. Uh, Ewan Lloyd, who would produce um, The Wild Geese, and David Frost uh, had signed on as co-producers. And not only that, but Toho in Japan, the company who famously made, uh, created and produced Godzilla films, had agreed to provide the special effects for the film. Um, so suddenly this project goes from an in-house production to having two significant co-producers and an entire other studio producing the effects for it. Uh, and in May 1976, during the Cannes Film Festival, there's a huge media blitz for Nessie, and the film carries a $7 million price tag, which is uh, way more than Hammer had ever spent on a movie. Uh, and Marcus Hearn um, succinctly and brilliantly kind of sums this up as Hammer's, Michael Curtis's uh, shit or bust strategy. Basically, Hammer were no longer able to sustain the company on their kind of modest gothic horrors that would produce, you know, that they would produce at a decent, decent budget and get a decent return back. They needed a big hit, a kind of four quadrant, internationally successful, huge hit. And the idea here was very clearly we're going to have to spend money uh, to make it. We're going to have to have a blockbuster. Um, and we'll get into what may have caused this. Um, very soon, although we date January 1976 and the idea that this is a a, at sea, a a sea monster movie probably has kind of hit a few light bulbs already. So Hammer were trying to put their biggest film together um, and they were doing it with one of the most complex production packages they put together as well. Uh, so Carreras uh, looked to Brian Forbes as the for the writer of this project, or certainly the, the person who would come on and, and kind of produce a workable um, draft, a kind of a final draft, a shooting script. Brian Forbes had done things like Stepford Wives um, and was kind of a, a, was well known. I think he'd done The Slipper in the Rose with David Frost just before this. So David Frost knew, knew him. He was also head of EMI for a while uh, and had in that role complained about Hammer um, and the fact that he had to put their films on his schedule um, because of like a backdoor deal done between the original managing director, James Carreras, and, and the former head of EMI. So we have a contract uh, in the archive drafted on the 11th of June, 1976. 
Uh, Forbes is given four weeks to work on the screenplay at $10,000 a week, an amount Forbes later refers to as, quote, below his market, market rate. Forbes is given first refusal to direct for a fee of $200,000 uh, for 26 weeks of production. Um, Hammer clearly expected Forbes to direct, with financiers being written to at the end of June by Hammer, assuring them that Forbes is going to direct the film. So Nessie, the script, um, as you can see, here's a script page from 1978. I don't know, I genuinely don't know if that was Hamlet trying to be funny on that script page or if they generally hadn't decided to look two years in. I, neither would surprise me. Uh, so Nessie begins with a pre-credit sequence of steroids called Mutane 4 spilling into Loch Ness because of a truck crash. So this isn't just the fictional prehistoric Loch Ness Monster is on the loose. It is the fictional prehistoric Loch Ness Monster has been enhanced by steroids and is on the loose. So it's high stakes, folks. Uh, Nessie is a one million year old uh, Elasmosaurus who, uh, as I say, is steroid enhanced. He grows uh, and leaves the lake uh, because it's polluted and he escapes into the ocean. Uh, and this leads to a number of set pieces as Nessie embarks on a journey to its ancient home in the South China Sea. Uh, the screenplay is structured around these handful of disaster sequences. Um, Nessie gets entangled with a nuclear submarine, tuna boats, he causes an oil rig disaster. Uh, and um, sorry, it's a, it's a her. Finally meets her end in the sea, some miles from Hong Kong Harbor. All of the places, mainly in the script, conveniently are places Hammer go to try and get some finance. Uh, so there's a sequence just outside of South Africa. And you can find a bit of correspondence to South Africa um, financiers to potentially get them. Um, to give a bit of money, um, there is, yeah, the, uh, a lot of sequences seem to be tied in directly with how they're going to fund it. And the attempt was they were going to try and fund it via piecemeal finance. So not just so they have Toho on board, giving a bit of the money towards the effects. David Lloyd, um, no, that was an amalgam amalgamation. Uh, David Frost, you and Lloyd hammer themselves and then they would go to separate financiers to try and piece this all together. So what inspired uh, Nessie? No surprises, it was primarily Jaws that had obviously come out the previous year. Um, this is not just subtext in the script, it is quite literally text. So in Brian, in, in one of Forbes scripts, it says, Nessie confronts a great white shark, bigger than Jaws, which looks astonished, brackets if possible, asking a lot of Toho actually there really, uh, then paralyzed, then with a flick of its tail, it's gone so fast it startles us, okay? So this was a direct attempt at cashing in on uh, Jaws and what's, you know, these jaw exploitation movies like Orca and things like that. This would have been an, another attempt at that. And made for the, the kind of crux being that they would have actually probably been made for not much less. So what went wrong? Well, what went wrong is that Forbes never agreed to direct it. Uh, and this clearly in correspondence led to uh, tensions between him uh, and Hammer generally. Originally, straight away, um, Forbes writes a piece uh, on signing the contract to Carreras and Lloyd. He says, I think it would be very wrong for me ever to ask for sole authorship of the piece. I believe that full recognition should be accorded to those previous writers who provided the framework and basic construction of the script. Obviously, you can only speculate, but there is a suggestion potential um, way of reading this, and particularly when you look at later correspondence, is that Forbes does not want to be the only one solely associated with this huge risk of a project that's being put together. However, what happens is, and this is kind of detailed in a, in a long piece of correspondence to, um, to Carreras from Forbes, Forbes goes to uh, David Frost's house, um, where they, uh, because they again they are their friends and Forbes looks on the table and he sees a script for um, Nessie and he is the sole author on the script. Not only is that against directly what he asked for, but then when he has a flick through the script, he notices that it's not even just the draft that he's done. Uh, someone has made changes to his draft and yet he is still the sole 
author of it. So not only is it not what he wanted, but there's also this kind of other kind of slap in the face as well. And here it kind of gets quite messy. Forbes notes to Carreras, what you do not have the right to do is to make such changes and without reference to me issue that script of a title page which states I am the sole author. This I object to most strongly and will, if necessary, take legal action to prevent. Um, so what you have happened there is an extraordinarily complex film uh, project actually becomes fatally um, marred by its relationship with its screenwriter and director. Um, there is a, an argument relating to Car Carreras and Forbes. Carreras says that he had signed Forbes with the assumption and kind of, you know, um, subtle agreement that he would direct the picture. Forbes says that's never true, and it ends up going through lawyers for remuneration. Uh, and while that is happening, potential funders come and go. So Toho tried to, tried to quit the project numerous times because they're having to build action sequences and then they'll get a new draft of a script that has a completely different sequence in it or, or a raising one that they've already worked on. They actually uh, hammer nearly get money from Columbia, um, but Columbia goes through a huge scandal with, um, I, think, I believe it's David Bergelman and um, the people, there's a huge clear out at Columbia. So the people who like the project have gone and then they're left with people who do not by the project. Um, and eventually it ends up in what Michael Carreras in that interview I referenced from when I was doing my MA, uh, when the service pro in dry dock. Uh, so in 1978, he says Nessie's in dry dock at the moment. It's the most, it's the common history of big films that they sometimes take years to make it onto the screen. Uh, he's not kidding uh, there. The Nessie obviously never makes it to the screen. That there is. I cannot find official confirmation, but I would say I am like 90% sure. I'm definitely happy to state my reputation on it because that's worth nothing, but I'm like worth 90% sure that is a bit of concept art of Nessie by Toho at the time. My, my one note on it would that it looks far too friendly for, for um, you know, a steroid enhanced prehistoric monster, but who am I? So Nessie ends up in Dry Dock 2 and, and never gets made and Hammer go out of business less than a year after. Uh, Carreras makes that statement. So these two projects, just to wrap up, um, both of these projects are, are, are kind of easy enough to talk about, or at least paint a picture of, because there's a decent amount of archival material held within the archive. Um, but huge gaps do still remain. There's several drafts of Nessie that Forbes mentions, that's mentioned over time, that Chris Wicking, uh, Clark Reynolds, one I mentioned, apparently the first script, it's not in the archive. Um, uh, the Car Carly, the only things we reference in terms of story materials are treatments, not screenplays. There was never a full script. We don't even know if a full script was written. Um, gaps within unmade films, obviously, but any archival study or of any movie will probably have gaps. Um, but unmade film studies, these gaps, can kind of be a lot more pronounced than in archival work on produced films, uh, as there's no finished text to work back or build off. You know, you don't, you know, we don't have a full cast where you can go, okay, let's have a look at this. Or, or, you know, you don't know who did the effects. You don't know where they were shooting on that day. There is no finished text to build that off. Um, so sometimes the archive is all that remains of these projects. And that's why they're obviously absolutely crucial in the work that the archivists do um, to be able to make these materials accessible and available is so, so crucial um, to being able to even talk about some of these. Mixed methodological approach uh, can, can help address the kind of absence there. So when I was talking about the initial timeline between um, Unquenchable First slash High Priest, all of that was given to me through extensive notes by Marcus Hearn, a historian. Hammer changes hands several times between the um, 80s to basically up until recently and each time obviously documentation is lost they move offices documentation is lost they didn't have an archive officially till 2012 Marcus Hearn had been at the company since the early 90s so it made notes copies scans uh, of kind of crucial things so he was extraordinarily useful and helpful in order to for me to sit down with him and, and together with the materials that kind of I had access to in the Hammer archive and his materials we were able to piece together this kind of jigsaw um, 
so that kind of stuff is really helpful. Obviously, emailing, uh, emailing, uh, interviewing uh, screenwriters uh, was something that was really useful. Hammer in the 1980s were trying to get productions made, they never did. But I managed to interview a couple of the screenwriters who could kind of talk about that process, even though obviously there's not much written on that kind of Hammer in the 1980s because they produced no movies. So as far as everyone was concerned, they were, they were closed down. But there is clearly active production going on, creative economic labor in the film industry that would kind of go, go missing or, or would not be examined uh, without considering unmade films. And yeah, so that's kind of the project that I will be putting together for the monograph that Laura mentioned for Edinburgh University Press, um, Hammer Goes to Hell. Uh, and that will kind of be the culmination of this project. What I'm also trying to do as a kind of a um, postscript is I'm looking at these uh, kind of adaptations of unmade material that have, that have happened recently. Two fantastic examples would be um, the Mayhem Festival in Nottingham did two live script readings. They did one on the Unquenchable Thirst of Dracula, where they, they, borrow, they um, working with uh, DMU before I was there, uh, they got a script for Unquenchable Thirst and they produced a live script reading of it. Uh, apparently it was fantastic. And then two years later, they did the same thing. They took the treatment for a film called Zeppelin v Pterodactyls um, that has a better title than the treatment is. Uh, but Stephen Scheel and Chris Cook, uh, Stephen Scheel adapted the treatment into a really interesting and cool screenplay. And him and Chris Cook, who had produced the um, Unquenchable, produced that as well. And that is so interesting to me, that idea that they took an unmade uh, treatment and then adapted it into it. They adapted it into a screenplay and then produced that as the reading. That kind of two steps of, of where does that mean? Where does that piece of media land then? Is that an unmade adaptation, or does that step in between change it? And once it, you know, once that adaptation is produced, even in a different form, where does it stand on that kind of unmade um, scale? Uh, and I did. Uh, I got some AHRC funding for a postdoc, six month postdoc, to put on a live script reading of one of Hammer's most infamous unmade films called uh, Vampirella, which was a comic book adaptation. Uh, and I got together a, a very, very lovely uh, and great cast of people. And they did a live script reading of that project directed by uh, Jonathan Rigby um, at the Regent Street Cinema in London in 2019. And that project tried to use multimedia effects. So I got a couple of the DMU um, existing students uh, to, to, to film it and, and help put that together. Uh, there was animations that were put together by DMU graduates, um, opening title sequences uh, and uh, cartoons and uh, things like that as part of it, as kind of a culminative multimedia project as well as the live script reading. Um, and effectively, what I'd like to do uh, by looking at these materials is see how you can use a made film to bridge these gaps between looking at adaptations but then also looking at things like fandom and nostalgia, like these projects, both all three of those script readings had a really interesting fan reaction to uh, and before they were really kind of um, taken on by a lot of the Facebook groups on, on Hammer and, and that kind of social media element. Um, so I really want to kind of look at these adaptations, examine what they mean for unmade films generally in terms of just unpicking them as transmedia adaptations of unmade material. But then also look at that idea of fandom and nostalgia, because for lots of unmade films out there that don't have archives or don't have materials that can be held in archives, um, fan kind of chatter about them or fan art, things like that online is some, some of the only kind of um, evidence of their existence in some places. So how these projects build off nostalgia and address that is something hopefully I'm going to put together to look at a bit later. But as you can probably tell by the vagueness, um, that isn't as all together there yet, but I, I do want to take a look at these. The BBC also did a uh, adaptation of Unquenchable Thirst of Dracula for their Unmade series on Radio 4, which had Michael Sheen narrating and was produced by Mac, uh, Matt Gattis. Um, and yeah, that's, that, that's kind of it. I mean, the, the thing I would very much like to do after this, or kind of the final thoughts, um, is, that this, uh, is that hopefully, as I meant when I name checked all those um, fantastic works on unmade films at the beginning is that unmade films can like intersect across multiple different areas of study and subjects. So film, media, 
adaptation, fandom, nostalgia, all of those things can be used. They're really, they are just good resources for that. Um, and the overall goal would not to just be, would not be to have a unmade films bit section, but would be to have that integrated into all, or at least most studies of film history that, you know, kind of a, a um, an acceptance that in order to produce a detailed film history of a production company, for example, that their unmade films have to be examined as well, because that is creative and financial labor. Um, that is potentially being left on the table. In order to do this, of course, the archive is a critical, crucial component of unmade films. Um, but as I mentioned, the mixed methodology that utilizes resources like interviews and fan magazines is the best way to at least limit, if not completely eradicate, uh, gaps and absences within the study. And again, as I say, examining these transmedia adaptations of unmade projects will hopefully help problematize, complicate notions of adaptation and nostalgia in interesting ways too. Um, so yeah, I would like to thank uh, Laura for having me uh, and, and the University of Hertfordshire uh, for having me today, uh, BAFs uh, for the New Connection Scheme, allowing me to do um, this talk as well, and, and Edinburgh University Press. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, and, and yeah, that's, that's it. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Kieran. Fantastic yeah, talk. Uh, there's lots of chat going on in, oh. in the chat. Um, about uh, Nessie and uh, Sherlock Holmes and all oh, sorts okay, of stuff at the minute. Okay, I'm um, just scroll through that. <laughs> happy to um, open up to any questions. I don't think we've got anything come up in the chat just yet, but um, if anybody has questions, please do um, feel free to put your camera and your mic on and um, have a chat. Um, or if you, you can raise your hand if you like, or we can take things. Chris Chandler, um, happy to take questions in the chat as well if people would rather type them out, I can always read them. So whatever you prefer, Chris. Yeah, really very interesting indeed. And as one of your slides said, the history of the film industry contains more unproduced films than produced mm. um, in, by a large number. I, I just interested in the, I don't think you, there's, there's particularly an answer to this, the, the various and complex reasons for why films are not produced. Mm. Uh, I, I'm very often, in your examples, financial, but um, films that are produced just because they're rubbish. Yep. Which kills a lot. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's an explanation for a lot of the Hummer ones, <laughs> I can tell you, <laughs> having read the scripts. <laughs> or unrealisable. Mm. Um, or in examples like I mean, well-known films, Full Monty, uh, Under the Skin, because it takes over a decade to get from mm -hmm. script to, you know, you, there's a long period where Under the Skin would have fallen into your category of an unproduced film. Yes, absolutely. Uh, with with creative labour on it all the way through. Yeah, uh, thirteen years is the is the the number I've seen. For, for, really, for Under the Skin. Yeah. I wasn't aware of that. Um, obviously, the big one at the minute is Don Coyote for Terry Gilliam, where he's finally produced that after the, being a such a famous unmade film that he had a documentary about it. So, yeah, yeah. Um, but, um, from, my, from my point of view, there's an interesting piece of work potentially to be done on on the industrial processes yes. that lead to uh, to particularly that sort of long term success of films that uh, are dormant for you know five, ten. 15 years. Yes, absolutely. And then end up either being produced or certainly in a certain thing. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and again, unmade films is such a, uh, a a weird nebulous term, you know, there's like unfinished films uh, and, um, you know, in the uh, in the editor collection um, that uh, James, David and I put together, there is people who talk about kind of B-roll footage or unused footage or alternative drafts and versions and how that can be pieced together and how, for example, a stage, that stage play of, uh, of an unmade script being produced or a radio play um, create it. But there's absolutely something in just that industrial <coughs> process of getting a film made. Um, and I think it is very much, if you get a film produced, that is the, a, a miracle <laughs> by all accounts. Uh, and, it's, and that's why I think looking at the unmade ones are are really crucial but yeah i didn't actually know that about under the skin i i, I do really, i've seen that film a number of times and i do really just, enjoy it just brief if you go onto the screen international site and google uh under the skin there's a really interesting account from the director oh great of, from glazer of, fantastic the, of the development process really really good article oh thank you chris that's great i'll, I'll do that that's that's really great thank you very much for your help thank you for the question thanks chris um, okay, we've got a couple come in chat. So first up, Ian Wilcox says, Wikipedia suggests that a new Vampirella production has just been announced. Is there a track record of long cancelled projects being revived? Hi, Ian. Hiya. Hiya. 
Thank um, you. <laughs> that's not, yeah. So Vampirella, one of the reasons that didn't get made for Hammer was because of the rights situation. Because it was a comic book property at the time that was actually still fairly popular at the time. Um, Hammer had difficulty with the rights. Um, Michael Curtis had the rights, but he only had the rights for certain things and characters and it got extraordinarily messy. Uh, and I know Vampirella, the rights for, the, for what Hammer has, even of their own script, is quite, is quite messy as well. Um, there is, they announced there's a, there was a very big ambitious statement on that movie saying that it's going to be a franchise and it's going to have a TV series and a film as well, right? Yeah, I, I look. I, I'd be first in line, but um, <laughs> I don't think I don't think Hammer are going to be have anything to do with no. it. I don't think they'll be anywhere near it. But yeah, I think sometimes uh, the, this does happen. Obviously, Chris just gave a fantastic example, uh, mm. Don Quixote. But I know um, there's. I don't know if Hammer will ever produce any of their unmade films or do anything like that. I think when we've talked to them about it, they've been very like, yeah, do what you like. Because with the Vampirella um, one, they were very, very kind and allowed us to do this production of it. Uh, when you'd think if they had any kind of eye on producing that kind of material, um, they would have been a bit more cautious. But they they give, they give, have things that they haven't given to the archive because um, they want to maybe look at doing stuff from, that was that second delivery was basically them being like, mm, all right, fine. There you go. We're done with that. You can have that. We're not going to do that. Uh, the first like load was a, a bit more cautious, I think. So they are actively, obviously, considering what they give the archive. Um, but I don't think they have any long-term plans on any of the unmade material that I know of as of yet. And nothing that they produced in this new wave existed pre um, okay. the pre seventies, like the Woman in Black and things. That wasn't a, an unmade hammer for a while or anything. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Cool. Cheers. Um, I've got one from Ivan, who unfortunately has had to dash off, but was very active in the chat the rest of the talk. Um, wanted to know whether the Hammer Archive includes any unmade episodes for the Hammer House of Horror TV series. Yeah. Apologies, he's not here for the answer, but... Um, <laughs> he would have been disappointed. Uh, the answer is no. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> the answer is no. We did look into that. There's a, there is entirely new TV series plotted out. Like, right. you know, there is Hammer TV stuff. Uh, but not anything that would be an episode of that show. Now, because we did look specifically, we were when Network released that great Blu-ray of um, Hammer House of Horror. They asked us about if there was any kind of, you know, when they were looking at special features on stuff. Uh, and just like Ivan would be, they were also disappointed that we just had to go, no, sorry. Um, yeah. So there's Hammer TV unmade, unmade TV stuff, but nothing on that show. No. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's see what else we have here. Um, so from Mike, uh, Mike, happy to read. Unless you're you're here, do you want to do you want to go for it yourself? I could read my own question, I guess. Uh, hi, Kieran. I, I guess it's just trying to look for uh, look for congruities in something that I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you for a great presentation. It was really amazing. Uh, so let's talk about in the in the study in the study of the artist prints. Academics have been lucky enough to access the vast archive prints kept himself. Um, okay, yeah, what's surprising vault. about that example is how much of that material in the archive has commercial potential uh, from scripts to unmade films to all the, the rumors of the unmade films from the, Ke the, the Kevin Smith film that's yeah. in the vault, all of that. Uh, it, to, uh, to Russians for Films Revolution. These days, when we're all fans of something, is there a commercial market? You're you thinking about the Prince example because they'll release anything and have it scheduled for the next 800 years. <laughs> um, uh, is, is there some sort of, you know, financial sort of, is there a potential for creating a, a sort of archive income around the Hammer Horror stuff? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because like the, I mean, <laughs> I haven't had to, you know, I haven't had to think with that head on, really. I mean, I think that the answer is, yeah, like H Hammer is such a, has such a kind of following and, and kind of, and I, I'd say cult following, but it's also just quite large. And obviously in terms of when you've got merch, you know, there's Hammer's, there's Hammer fridge magnets and Hammer coffee cups and stuff. Like they are, um, there's, you know, Hammer posters, if you're, you know, sad enough. Uh, people, you know, there is all of this merchandise around Hammer. Um, and the Vampirella show that we did um, was what sold, it, it sold out and we had people coming from everywhere. And uh, when I do kind of public talks like outside academic um, kind of um, 
conferences or, or, or talks like this, they a lot mostly the questions are like, do you think they'll make it or would they, would they make this and would they? I think there is like even if they did them as like audio books, I think the BBC yeah. show shows how cool that would be. Um, I think if they, yeah, I think there absolutely could be, you know, novelizations, comic books, graphic novels, all of these things come into my head uh, when I think about it. I don't think many of them would make uh, g- good movies. <laughs> I do genuinely think that sometimes when, you know, the open and shut case might be that the script wasn't very good. Um, but yeah, I did, absolutely. Yeah. And like I say, with the Prince thing, uh, I know obviously like I say when I see kind of David the David Bowie sets that come out as well in terms of like archival live performances with, with certain kind of institutions and networks and I'm always a sucker for those too uh, I think the answer would probably be yes but it'd be uh, it'd be in a different form than a movie and I don't know if they had any interest in doing that or, or what but I think the fandom is certainly better for it I'd buy them yeah me too <laughs> thank you Thanks, Mike. Um, okay, Barbara um, Barbara uh, asks if presumably with streaming platforms, there are now more opportunities for unmade films to be rewritten potentially as limited TV series. Is that something we've seen happen at all or something you could imagine happening? Uh, oh, there was one. Oh, um, <laughs> shoot, I, I think there was an unmade film that eventually did get a limited series, but I can't I can't think of it. I mean, I don't know. Maybe, maybe some of these would work as TV. I think there's a Vlad the Impaler origin story that is very, very cool in the archive. And that's a very wordy script because it's a self-adaptation of a radio play. <laughs> and uh, and the guy, so the guy is like, it's all gold. It's all going in. So you just end up with <laughs> lots of dialogue. Uh, it's not quite as, as brutal as an adaptation as maybe it could be. Uh, and I always think of that as something like a series or... Or, or, or something like that but I don't again I don't think there's nothing that comes to mind immediately yeah again okay thank you um one from Wendy uh more of a more of a rambling comment than a question uh she says coming from um um the archive uh, the archive is generally terrible at recording gaps and silences and I agree that looking to alternative sources is important, um, but we need a change to how archives work in this respect. More oral history, I would even go so far as to suggest documenting stories heard, word of mouth, etc. cetera. Um, there's so much focus on thinking about what is there, um, that what is not there is usually forgotten or, or not documented. Um, Chris follows that up by saying, you know, BAFTA, um, BFI and BEC2 all have oral history projects. Um, and Elle's Tree Project yeah. as well, which we have at, at, at Hearts, um, but it's how much they cover unmade work, I guess. Yeah, the Elle's Tree is fantastic. Obviously, that was a huge part of Hammer in the later stages. That's where they were based. Um, mm-hmm. So that's really fascinating. But yeah, no, I, I agree. When you like say the archives are just, they're so, so crucial to unmade uh, films. I think every, and these get those gaps and absences and silences uh, are so, so much more pronounced when there is when that is it of a project, when it is all of those documentation. And yeah, that kind of, that oral side of it, in terms of interviews, in terms of people who were there at the time, would be, and has proven to be super crucial sometimes in illuminating some of those gaps. So yeah, no, I fully, fully get that, I agree. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know Becca had done a, a lot of work with, particularly with women working mm-hmm. uh, working in the industry. Yeah. Um, I transcribed a, an interview with Chili Boucher uh, from from oh. decades past. Yeah. Uh, which, I know um, cool. Franc- Francis Galt uh, did a really good oral history of the women in trade unions as well, yes. and, and and that is a really really extensive historical kind of document all told through yeah. oral histories as well. Yeah, it's a really really vital um, tool yeah. for sure. Well, as we're, as we're talking about women, I'm, I've got a question which I'm going to chair's prerogative and jump in with if anybody <laughs> wants to think of some more questions while I talk. Um, I, in terms of gender, you, you talked um, quite early on about, about how these long gaps in women's careers mm-hmm. um, are quite often the result of funding gaps and so on. So it's really mm-hmm. interesting that when we talk about uh, unmade films and we're talking about noted, noted unmade films, the ones that people know of, they're the, yep. the guys on the front of the book cover that you showed at the start, right? Yeah. So, so Kubrick, Hitchcock, uh, so on, and you talked about Terry Gilliam a little bit. Yeah, yeah. As well. um, so these kind of like never were projects that are actually pretty famous, so Napoleon uh, yep. or Don Quixote. Like, mm-hmm. um, so do you see in your research, are you seeing kind of I guess kind of tiers of acknowledgement is there kind of a divide between the sort of invisible unrecognized labor 
um, in, in the development and treatment processes, particularly mm. by women uh, and maybe people from other marginalized groups, mm -hmm. as opposed to the work by kind of celebrated male film auteurs. Yeah. Um, I would say that my that the Hammer script that the Hammer's setup is almost exclusively um, white white male. Like any like all that research I mentioned there, that have excellent research that have been done at kind of decentering that look at just the um, that kind of accepted auto canon have has kind of been done exploratory by um, um, Shelley Cobb and, and like say Hannah has used a really interesting feminist lens in that. Michael, mm. there is huge potential for that kind of study uh, and you can see how it does disrupt that immediately because these like say like, even super contemporary like Patty Jenkins who just he was obviously an extraordinarily um, successful filmmaker at the moment just did two Wonder Woman movies uh, she was famously booted off uh, for mm. uh, two I think after winning an Oscar for, for Monster and, and has this kind of huge gap of like no production until this kind of uh, break um, with, with um, Wonder Woman. And I just think, and like I say, and these huge gaps are so clear that there's work going on there that needs to be discussed and decentered. The one thing I did, obviously my research is, uh, the Hammer Project is almost exclusively male, but one thing you do note, at least looking through it, is that you, you kind of have to, by obviously necessity, move away from the director and you start looking at production in a much more kind of detailed sense. So a lot of the time that you spend examining the screenwriter, uh, because that's sometimes all that's left of that project. Um, the project actually very much developed clearly into almost a story about My Michael Carreras as managing director uh, and his management style and how that company is, is run on an industrial level. Um, so you don't, obviously that kind of director focused approach, even though people seem to pick their projects to look at, if you're doing a production study as I did, that goes out the window. So what mm -hmm. I found was um, a nice kind of balance of, oh, okay, so this by necessity, I'm not talking about Terence Fisher and I'm not talking about these kind of hammer, how a hammer film looks and the, or the hammer house style. I'm looking at who's writing them or, you know, was it on spec, were they in-house? What was the relationship there? What was the, uh, what was the kind of hierarchies and things like that? So there is a decentering um, in terms of methodological approach, but in terms of actual kind of gender and things like that, the Hammer Project is a uh, is not a good example of that. And I think people like Shelley Cobb, uh, and just in that blog post, it kind of muses on on how it can be used. That actually pictures what would be a really really incredible uh, and and worthwhile examination. I think. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, oh, I've got a, a long one here from someone. Just have a look. Uh, another one from Mike, wondering aloud here. Oh, Mike, do you want to yeah. just go for My it? Answers. I didn't realize it would come to me so quickly. I thought <laughs> others would have questions. I was just wondering aloud, I think, uh, but I wonder how much of the end of Hammer had a little to do with the film school brats becoming prolific and using the UK as shoot locations. Um, uh, you know, they took sci-fi and horror very seriously, thinking Star Wars, Close Encounters. And with the Star Wars movie, using huge amounts of the UK film industry, actors, techs, and film studios, even employing actors who were in Hammer Films. Is there a link between Hammer winding down and the British film industry retooling for the international production it is now known for? And I, again, I'm just thinking out loud. Um, kind of, yeah. I think. Well, the thing is that Hammer were crucially always aware of the trends and, and the film school brat thing that you mentioned is absolutely something Hammer were aware of. Hammer were also aware of the horror films uh, shift towards respectability uh, in uh, in you know with um, like things like Rosemary's Baby and, and, and things like that, and, and obviously Friedkin. There's a really great memo from Michael Carrera. He's like he just he doesn't. He's like I don't get The Exorcist. I don't get it. And then five years later, he does a really cool um, possession movie to the Devil a Daughter, which isn't that well liked, but has a lot of cool stuff in it. But um, anyway, yeah. But there's actual there's they actually go to filmmakers like Ken Russell to make. There to try and make things like Vlad the Impaler, the unmade one I mentioned, they go to Ken Russell. They have a clear thing of they understand the trends and how they're happening uh, and they're very much on it. In terms of actual physical international production and what's happening, that I don't know. Part of me, Hammer were very much, they filmed in Britain, but they were so reliable on international finance. 
um, that I think they just got outdid on scale. I think these that, that shit and bust method I mentioned that comes in with Nessie, Vampirella, Vlad the Impaler. They, he clearly sees that they have to go bigger with their production and international co-productions and even filming away from Britain. They, they try and film in Romania for Vlad the Impaler until uh, the Romanian government says that's actually quite a reductive look at us as a culture, so we're not going to allow you to do that. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's, there's clear acknowledgement that they have to do something different, and they're very much on trend. But, yeah, it's a, it, it's, I don't know if that actually the physical takeover of Britain as an international base um, affected them too much. Thanks, Mike. Um, Cheers, Chris Mike. has his hand up. But I just uh, exactly on the discussion, I think if you look at the timeline, there's quite a chunk of time between Hammer sadly going belly up and actually the nadir of the British film industry in the really mid 80s. Yeah. You know, we're looking towards 85, 86 before things really start to pick up yeah, in any significant degree, either in terms of audiences or or, um, or production, I, I, it's an interesting chain of thought. But it, it, there's, there's a, an uncomfortable gap. Uh, absolutely, there. and that's why I do kind of have I do take issue with those kind of close readings of the films that suggest that it's just stagnation that did hammer in. When really you see the incomplete industry at this crucial turning point and just having having that kind of industrial focus. Yeah. Because although Hammer didn't massively take from the like the ED Levy and that they were they were they had an international co-production in the early 50s with Robert Libert Productions. They were before before the ED Levy, before any of their big films, they were producing B movies for American markets. And they perfected that. They'd get an American actor over who was maybe a bit past their kind of prime. They'd do a 60, 70 minute B movie and they'd send it back to America and they would work with Lippert Productions to do that. Hammer always had its eye on transatlantic success, even before they were a significant production company at the time. So that American finance going from them cannot be overstated. Like, yeah, and I, and, and I, I understand that some of their films are repetitive. You know, there's only so many, you know, Dracula movies have a very particular formula, but it certainly is not only stagnation that you can consider in terms of their their films itself. The production aspects, as you mentioned, are, are, are massive and and I think critical. And I, and I think the, the general malaise of the international or the yeah. Euro American film industry it mm -hmm. covers that the entirety of that period. There's very very complex economic. I, I don't. Yeah. Talk on cultural, but econ economic and, and, and business elements. Which... There is, yeah, and you, and a look at Hammer in the nineteen eighties is really fascinating. That all made stuff that I mentioned. That would be, it would have had to have been another thesis. I only got to have half a chapter on it, but the, that 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 examination of when Michael Curtis leaves in seventy nine and Hammer gets taken over and they do the telly series Hammer House of Horror, but they're trying to do other productions as well, and all of them are piecemeal. Euro putting attempts at, at that kind of finance that never come together and just migraine inducing to look at some of the documentation. <laughs> a smarter man than me will be needed to make sense of some of the attempts at finance. But yeah, it's a, it's a really messy period. Mm. Um, and, the eight, and, and the 80s is a really fascinating look at what Hammer would be doing as well. You wonder but if, again, if you're a company like Hammer would be able to hang on for the home video revolution you know, not yeah. many years later. Yeah, maybe what they were on the bottom line. They were already looking at telly. They they were gonna do Frank. They were gonna do remake. Well, they they were the managing director said they they were gonna. Uh, who's very much a you know say old school salesman, but he was very much like, oh, we're gonna uh, we're gonna remake Frankenstein and Dracula for TV, and he says, and we're gonna do um, we're gonna do Vlad the Impaler uh, as a television series. We're going to do uh, a Bram Stoker biopic. Uh, for television and it's going to be like Ken Russell's composers thing we're going to do it on gothic authors and we'll have one on Edgar Allan Poe one of, but obviously none of this there's nothing in the archive about that uh, just in interviews but he's very much talking extensively about telly uh, in the 70s and I think he yeah they, Hammer were keen survivalists they would have been straight on the home video thing if they could have adapted quickly enough I think or lasted yes. more, more accurately for sure <laughs> Yeah. Um, question from Danny. Danny's got his hand up. 
Oh, hi. I could actually see if my hand was still up or not. I started, I was it was, gonna start it was there, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, Kevin, that was really good. I think you should do your next talk in the style of Anthony Hines, you know, maybe with a, a just pipe a small cigarette, yeah, yeah, yeah small cigarettes. Just I think cough all the way through it, though. Yeah, I think that'd be quite good. Um, yeah, it was uh, it was it was really interesting when you're talking about um, you know the the sort of the shit or bust as you were yeah. calling it, you know, approach. And it's it's weird because uh, the the very final chapter of my PhD that I'm kind of just finishing up now is about um, the very end of Ealing, you know, in like '57, mm. and they basically took the same thing. They had a co they had co-productions with MGM and so on, and did a very similar thing, which is why they basically disappeared which weirdly enough hammer then picked up almost yeah. the smack didn't they and sort of moved into it so i mean my question really you know is, is more about like you know those directors you know with uh, roy ward baker and mm -hmm. terence fisher and so on and we're kind of known for noirs and more social realist sort of stuff before they went over to hammer mm -hmm. i'm just kind of interested if you know if there was any sort of unmade projects that were they were attached to that kind of fitted more into that that sort of thing that you got more in the early 50s or yeah there was um I mean, in terms of directors attached, that there's not not many that have that kind of direct correlation. There is a really interesting script in the BFI archive, and I'm just going off memory. And obviously, as we know, this must have been at least two and a half years ago. Um, but it was a it's called Dracula 3D, and it's and it's addressed to Terence Fisher, uh, based on his gothic horror thing and there's a whole production plan centered around Fisher as a director um, uh, to do it like he was at that point known for it but in terms of actual Hammer movies I don't think any of them had Fisher's seal of it obviously by the time the Dracula or May Dracula one start coming up um, he's finished with Dracula um, as of Prince of Darkness so and Roy Ward Baker I don't think is attached to it. I think it's mainly screenwriters that are consistent across it. A lot of these projects don't even get as far as directors, if I'm honest, um, yeah. uh, Danny. And when they do, they're in that shit or bust phase where they're looking for bigger fish. So they're looking for your your um, your kind of your Ken Russell, somebody a, a name director who will actually sell it to um, international co-producers. I think. Uh, so, just yeah. one more thing as well. Uh, my my PhD supervisor, a good friend of mine, Paul Moody, who's over at Brunel. I'm not sure if you know him. Mm -hmm. He 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 wrote a book on EMI uh, Studios, yeah, the film productions. But he actually, um, I don't know if it's in his book, but he actually went to the the archives in Washington. Believe it or not, that's where they are. Yeah. So he got into the dusty old rooms and found <laughs> everything. It might be worth contacting him because obviously I know that he knows a bit about the some of the co-productions. Yeah, so he, he might have stuff in there. I'm not really sure. I'm yeah, not sure. If a really good shout and I was not aware of that the yeah. uh, that EMI archive because EMI did have a big part in commissioning a lot of Hammer's movies um they had the James Carreras who was in charge of Hammer in their like you know the, the bigger period had a had a deal had a lot of deals with EMI so that would that might have a really good shout yeah. uh, if you want to contact me separate or contact me through law and I'll, I'll yeah. be able to just get you in I contact might do. Yeah, it, might, really. it definitely would be worth covering that base before um uh, the book the, before the book <laughs> and, and, I, and there's a huge gap in that so yeah absolutely thank you that's really useful Cheers, Danny. thanks a lot yeah thanks, uh we have time maybe just for one final quick question if anybody has one speak now forever hold your peace <laughs> okay i'm gonna take that as a no um in which case um i would like uh to thank kieran one final time um, for uh, his, his excellent talk today. And thanks so much everybody for coming and for some fantastic questions. Um, very appreciated um, and a really great discussion to end our academic year. So really appreciative. Thanks. Thank you so much, everybody. And <laughs> thanks. thanks to Kieran. Many thanks, Kieran. Thank you. Thanks guys. Cheers. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Kieran. Have Thank a nice you. summer, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs>